Five, four, three, two, one. Boom. Hello, and welcome to Design Chat, the best design discussion on the internet. Um, I am Ryan McGovern, your host on Twitter. I'm at uh, Hoopajub, H-U-P-A-J-O-B. We are tweeting that out right now. Um, so welcome. Uh, this, this week we have special guest uh, Dustin Hostetler. I know that uh, last week I said we are going to have Chuck Anderson, but he's got some clients he's working with. He's a very, very busy man. We'll get him on in the future. For those of you who want to see Chuck, hold on to your horses. Tonight we have the one and only Dustin Hostetler. Thank you for uh, coming to hang out on such short notice, Dustin. Thanks for having me. Anytime, anytime. Um, you came highly recommended from Chuck. Um, he, and I, he and I are good friends. And, uh, yeah, he's an awesome guy. And, um, and so it, was, it didn't take long to sort of dig into, you know, your, your web representation to just be absolutely floored by the stuff that you're doing and how much of it, the volume that is out there. Um, Thanks. So, yeah. Um, so everybody welcome Dustin in the chat room. Let's get some interaction going here. So Design Chat is all about, uh, you know, bringing uh, cool design peeps to the design community. Um, it's a free show. Uh, like I said last week, we're going to be up on iTunes very, very shortly. We're dealing with some technical uh, back-end stuff. Um, so please look for that in the, in the near future. Um, and uh, yeah, it should be cool. So uh, a brief introduction. I'm going to steal it directly from uh, your website because uh, that's how I roll. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I've lost my link. All right, here we go. Uh, Dustin Hostetler, graphic artist, publisher, and curator, working in America since 1999 from Toledo, Ohio. Some of his clients include Mountain Dew, Motorola, Martini and Rossi, Scion, MTV, MTV TR3S, Upper Playground, Casio, The Webbies, and it just keeps on going on and on. Verizon, Air America, Toshiba, Nokia, all, all the big guys. Um, uh, your website is DustinHostetler.com. Uh, we're going to throw that up in the chat room uh, so people yeah. can go see your... But don't leave the chat right now because we are going to be showing some of his work here. Um, go check that out after the chat, please. Um, so I wish I had one of those. I don't, though. I'll work That's on patience. it. Patience. Does it? Um, yeah, lots of patience. <laughs> is that something you do while you draw? Most of my day is just spent... <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Can you wiggle it? Wiggle it. Oh, see, that's talent. That's talent. That's why we bring uh, interesting people to design chat. <laughs> um, so, all right. Well, tell us a little bit more about your story. Anything that we might have missed, or you know, where where your be creative beginnings were. Yeah. Um, so I've been doing illustration under the name of Upso for the past going on 10 years. Um, I started publishing a magazine called Fastetic about nine and a half years ago, so soon after I started doing the illustration stuff. And more recently, uh, the past six or seven years, I've been running a studio with my wife called Studio Sans Nam. And uh, for the past two years, up until pretty recently, I was the special projects curator at Threadless, running their select line. That's awesome. Um, so, I mean, your work is kind of spread out through a number of different channels, if you will, um, you know, a handful of which are sort of entrepreneurial. You know, you've kind of ventured out and, and, uh, and you know, started your own business with your studio and, and the magazine. Um, so how long has the magazine been out now? Next year it'll be 10 years. And 10 years. That's insane. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. That's awesome. Thanks. Um, and how, how would people find your magazine and, and actually get their hands on a copy? Uh, so I just recently switched uh, distribution. I'm working with a company uh, based in Tampa. I'm going to type it out here called Inprint. They do mm -hmm. awesome, uh, awesome uh, on-demand print sales, art prints. And so right now the best way to get it is just to go to fastpedic.com. Mm -hmm. And I'm working on in the short term, getting them back out into stores. Um, since I do all my own distribution, it takes a lot of uh, legwork to continually stock them in stores. I don't work through a third-party distribution. Here's the, the new issue. I actually have the whole pile of the past. Oh, that's awesome. It's, you know, I, I forget sometimes how much of how much I've produced until I stack them all up. And I wait, oh, there you go. 
So that here's is so cool. 12, 12 issues of Pathetic. Um, and if you go to pathetic.com, there, uh, there are some preview pages for each issue, so you can kind of get a, at least a little sense of what previous sold-out issues look like. That's got to be so gratifying to be able to pick up that work and just, like, it's tangible. Here, look, this is what I've done. Yeah, is that one of the most exciting things about doing it? Yeah, absolutely. Any project, I mean, whether it's illustration or the magazine or product design, the most gratifying part is once it's been made. You know, being invited to do something is exciting, working on a project is exciting, but when that sample shows up in the mail, um, it's the most gratifying part of it. I really love, I mean, not to try to, like, fill the earth with, uh, you know. With garbage. <laughs> garbage, but I really like producing as many products as possible. It, it feels really good. Um, so speaking of your work in tangible items, um, what I've done is I, I went to your website and I grabbed a handful of uh, screen captures of all the work that you've posted. So let's let's just kind of roll through a few of them and hear the stories behind, you know, how the job started and, and you know, their, its sort of progress. I think the sure. first one I've got here is the Mountain Dew uh, ah. bottles. And I've got one here as well. <laughs> well yours is better. Uh, yeah, it's, you can kind of see the sparkle in it a little better. Um, That's awesome. So yeah, uh, with this project, this just came out uh, just last month, middle of uh, beginning of September. Um, if you go to greenlabelart.com, it'll uh, talk about the artists involved this year. But um, about a year ago, they contacted me pretty much out of the blue. I didn't, you know, I didn't know anybody at uh, Pepsi or Mountain Dew personally, but their curator contacted me and invited me to be one of the six artists. And they just, uh, of course, I said yes. And they sent me a flat template. I did a bunch of different ideas. They pick the one they like the best and which I like the best too which I don't know if it's easy to tell or not but it's sort of closed sleeping eyes at the bottom and by the time they've you know hit the top where the Mountain Dew comes out the you know the wide wake nice and uh, yeah so then it took about a year through production and sampling and uh, they came out last month they also did a corresponding all the uh, all the artists got to do under the bottle cap promotion products so I did a G-Shock watch which I actually haven't gotten one yet so I can't show you but it's just got uh, eyeballs all around the, the strap of it. So how did like when they approach you with one of those projects how specific are they about like what they want? Is it all like okay it's got to be about the energy um, and just do your thing or is it like so we're thinking we want a bottle with eyeballs? Go. Sure it really depends on the client and with Mountain Dew they were really uh, open to anything they wanted to just represent the artist's work. You can tell when you look at the whole series, they're really diverse and none of them specifically reference soda or anything like that. I actually went a little more literal just because I thought it would be fun to incorporate the green and to you know, have it translate specifically to the bottle versus just having it be a random uh, illustration. But they were totally open to anything I wanted to do. That's awesome. Um, next one we got here is a Converse shoe. Seriously, a Converse shoe? That's awesome. Yeah, that was pretty exciting. That's actually how Mountain Dew found out about me. That came out um, a little over a year ago, uh, and it was the same kind of thing. They had a curator working on, uh, it's a special promotion with the 100 year anniversary of Converse, and they had picked 100 artists each to limited edition shoes, and they contacted me totally out of the blue. I still don't know how they found me, but uh, they once again just said, do whatever you want, here's a blank template, you pick the colors, you decide what the graphic is and I think I only gave them the one option for that and they approved it right away so it was pretty easy to work with them. Nice. Um, I think, oh, this one was uh, for your Scion tour. Yeah, uh, that was super fun too. It was like about three or three and a half years ago they invited uh, myself and five other artists including uh, Sage Vaughn, Dalek, Maya Hayek and we all had to do, this was more specific, they had us do cube box themed art because they were uh, celebrating the Scion XB, which is that really boxy car. Mm -hmm. So I just, because I typically put myself into the art, like the eyeballs in the Mountain Dew bottle are my eyeballs. So for the box head stuff, I just put my face on all these different floating cubes. And uh, they actually then built these big uh, cubes you could walk inside of that had the art printed on the inside of it, and they hung them from the ceiling. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So now that we've seen a couple different examples of like your style and, and how it, it all sort of looks, let's let's talk about like process. Are you like a, a pen and paper kind of guy? Like where do you start? You start in Sketchpad or do you go right to the computer right away? Well, I am 100% digital, but uh, my 
like I, I didn't I didn't go to school for illustration. Um, I went to school for graphic design. So I'm really comfortable with thumbnailing out things before I work on something. Mm -hmm. um, so I typically just take a couple sheets of paper and draw out like really rough, barely legible little scribbles to kind of get the basic, you know, whatever layout I'm comfortable with. And once the idea is in my head, it just, it's the painful execution then. Because pretty much once I've decided what it's going to be, it doesn't change until, you know, I make it. How long would one of these works take you? From like very first idea to finished art, you're turning it into the client. Uh, good question. Um, I'm typically working on five or six different products projects at once. So, you know, in any given day, I'm not giving a whole twelve hours to one thing. But uh, like for the sort bottle, of, sort of hard to quantify. Then it's hard to quantify. But I mean, if I just were to do like that bottle, once I got the client to approve the concept. Uh, it just takes like a couple days. I mean, it's not, or, and it's you know, not even that really. So, what's your like workspace like? Is it like, you know, just always like mayhem with lots of projects going on, or is there like some sort of strict organization? I know you were saying you turn on the light and you're like, oh, I don't want to show my office. No, is it like yeah, total seriously. craziness? Yeah, I mean, look at my bookshelf. It's awful. It's just. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, oh, to answer you got, that like, question, kinds of paper. Uh, paper samples, but then it's just a lot of. I'm a, I collect zines pretty seriously, so it's a lot of zines and then art magazines and books. Uh -huh. uh, to, to answer that one person, the Avron's question, I use freehand. Uh, I'm still a macromedia person, which is ridiculous, but uh, I'm, I'm, I still haven't figured out how to use, use Illustrator yet. Um, but no, I, I it's total awful chaos in here, and um, same way with my desktop on my computer. I have uh, no organizational skills whatsoever. <laughs> well, some people thrive in that, you know, that's like, that's just the structure that, you know, you're meant to work in, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, um, I, I make no apologies. <laughs> as you shouldn't. I forgot to mention earlier, um, during the announcements, it, it, so we'll do sort of like an hour long chat. Um, uh, you can add, you can, you can shoot questions out if you're in the chat room, uh, throughout and actually we'll sort of like capture them. And then, uh, near the end of the chat, about 15, 20 minutes out, We'll uh, serve those back up, and we'll go. We'll run through questions and give you credit, and, and you know, and do a little Q and A sec, uh, session with uh, with Dustin. So, so definitely keep on throwing those questions out during the chat, and we will we will get to them for sure. Um, the, ignore that last question. That was my brother, who's actually in the room. He is now being ignored. He's out. <laughs> We're kicking him I'm out. Gonna, I'm going to keep reading your questions. Okay. <laughs> my bed does my hair. <laughs> That's awesome. Hold on. Okay, there we go. It's hard. It's hard to do that backwards. So um, yeah, definitely keep on throwing those questions out there. Um, so you just spent. I think you. Uh, we were emailing earlier. Uh, two years working uh, with Threadless for Skinny Corp as yeah. a curator. Well, that's yeah. like that sounds like one of the coolest jobs ever. Like, so was it like you would just receive all of these designs all the time? And actually, we should explain, Threadless is a uh, t-shirt design company. Um, designers submit uh, t-shirt designs, and then they get voted on or, or moved up. And the ones that are picked, those artists get paid. And, you know, and then they keep on turning over these designs. So there's always something new and something fresh coming out of this, uh, this group, which is really cool. So, um, so I guess my question is, like, what's the process of that? I mean, did, did you get like 500 submissions a day and just have to go through and pick out? Which no, ones no, 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 no. So what was unique about my job compared to uh, a lot of the other Threadless jobs. Um, I curated by going out and bringing in new artists to the community, not the people that were regular submitting designs, and okay. inviting them to do uh, a shirt for the Select series, which uh, is the curated invite-only portion of Threadless, where it has nothing to do with the voting process. Right. And my goal was to find as many completely different people and styles and approaches to garments uh, in hopes that it would then inspire the uh, community portion of Threadless, you know, when they would see some sort of crazy design that wouldn't necessarily uh, win the regular Threadless uh, way of doing things. It might give people new ideas uh, to approach their regular designs. It seems like and that's... Actually that... Go ahead. Oh, well, sorry. I was just going <laughs> to say, I, I... this all came up because... Uh, Threadless had sponsored issue six of Fastetic in 2006, oh, nice. 2006, and when I approached them again in 2007, 
uh, to see if they wanted to sponsor the next issue. Um, they instead offered me this full-time job curating for them. So I basically tapped into the artists I had already curated through Fastetic and brought them to Threadless. Very cool. Um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, so let's keep on moving in, in uh, some of these uh, images we've got here. Um, we've got expressive mustaches here. So that's again for the, the Scion tour, the Scion art tour. Yeah. Um, we'll just keep on going. Um, so these are all individual pieces. Like how, what, what's the scale like? I mean, are these large scale, are these itty bitty? Like where, the, I mean, the, those what's are the actually, final tangible product like? Those Scion pieces were, were actually some of the biggest pieces I've ever done. They were uh, like five foot squares, which typically I'm working in like an 18 by 24 inch uh, canvas area. So they were, they were big by my standards. Uh -huh. um, just so they could, actually they're only big so they could build those big cubes people could go inside. That was, that was why they, they got to. Oh, cool. So, um, so this one, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting uh, the context in which this one came out, but it yeah, kind of looks like the same uh, Thunderbolt thing that was on the Converse shoe. Yeah, it's a similar design. Um, it was done at the same time. It was uh, done for my friends. Uh, they go by Glue Kit. Some of you guys might be familiar with Glue Kit. Um, and they do a project called Part of It where uh, artists get to do a design and it gets applied to t-shirts and bags and, and then all the profits from it go to the charity of the artist's choice. So I did this bag that said Make Art Now on it and then all the money went to a local Toledo, Ohio arts charity. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Is this the same? Yeah. Same project? Like it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes the images are kind of blown out. If I do this, it helps. Not really. No, but I, yeah, so that, that's the uh, skateboard I did a few years ago with uh, MPH Labs. They let me uh, print it in fluorescent colors, so it was a very eye-catching, eye-popping design. Um, when, you, when you get into tangible things like that, what sort of like surfaces and like inks you know, um, like different types of papers. Do you have preferences that you usually lean towards that go, you know, go well with your style? Yeah, uh, most of my fine art or gallery stuff is printed on um, watercolor paper. So, because everything I do is digital, and I'm tr I try to even, I'm not trying try to hide the fact that it's digital, I try to uh, make the final product look as sort of non-digital as possible. And when you do vector art printed on watercolor, it tends to look kind of silk screened. Uh -huh. um, and then when I do something like a skateboard or any of the toy stuff I've done, I tend to want to use glow-in-the-darks or fluorescent inks to kind of make them pop out a little bit and do things I can't do on the computer. You know, I can't do glow-in-the-dark on the computer or, you know, right. fluorescent. Well, this one's a, a, an example of strictly computer art. This is sort of a, a background or, or a frame for, um, for MTV. Is yeah. it one of their websites? Actually, if you go to, I think even now, if you go to mtv.com and keep hitting hard refresh, the background design will keep changing. Oh, that's About cool. About a year and a half, two years ago, yeah, they invited a bunch of artists to just do these, I think they called them hats. And so that was my hat, which still, I think, shows up if you, I've, I've tried a couple times recently and it, it does still pop up. Oh, that's awesome. And this, I think, is some personal work of yours from uh, George Bush and Lindsay Lohan action. Yeah. Yeah. I did that a while ago, and uh, only recently did Lindsay Lohan stop looking like that. And so I need to redraw it with more of a uh, older, more aged, uh, weathered Lindsay Lohan. George Artie Bush Warren, looks the same. perhaps? Yeah. Artie now, where, where in the sort of, like, Bush administration... I, you know, did this come out? Like, what was the timing there? That was maybe four years ago. That was midway between terms. So she was probably uh, still a teenager when that was done. I think this one is, uh, 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 which radio, for a radio station, uh, Free Oh, um, Air America. Air yeah, America, Air that's right, that's right. They did, uh, maybe two years ago, a book called, like, the Air America Handbook. And I illustrated all the people that wrote, contributed to the book, and also did the cover art for it. Well, it's fantastic. There's all the on-air personalities. 
and I do a lot of that kind of work, I'll, even though a lot of my the stuff I showcase is just sort of a little more arty stuff. I typically my day to day commissions are just going to be portraits of people. Uh, like I just spent last week drawing. Uh, there's a magazine called More Magazine, which is for women 40 and over, and I drew 10 notable women in their 40s, uh, which is not something I would you typically expect from my work, but it's it's how I spend most of my time. Drawing. Um, I think this one was an illustration for. Um... Uh, men's magazine. Yeah, was, uh, about the effects of coffee. caffeine. Yeah, <laughs> that's all. It's kind of hard to see the second one. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. We've got sleepy eyes, and then we've got caffeine eyes. Oh, my focus is going out a little bit. This is sort of an experiment. I mean, I've done a few episodes where I'm showing artwork behind, um, or it's just the logo. But sometimes because it's like the the, the actual light coming at the camera, it's hard to focus. Well, uh, pretty much all these things are on upso.org as well, so if people want to check them out again. Every single them. one of them, that's where I stole them from. Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't steal them. We are showing them uh, in, uh, in celebration of your work. I shouldn't say steal. Um, so, okay. Uh, moving on. Think Face Magazine. So your blog is, um, is sort of supported by your magazine. I think the URL is um, thinkfacedmagazine.com. No, it's uh, Festhetic.com is the magazine, and then think.festhetic.com is the, there you go. the blog. Um, and it's because the magazine is just me. Uh, I mean, I just had my first intern for the last issue, but previously and going on, I don't have any uh, co-workers on this, so mm -hmm. even though it's the Fastetic blog, it's really my blog because I'm pretty much the only contributor to it. Oh, is the intern there? Is Greg there? Hey, Greg. Oh, he's in the chat? Hey, there he is. Yeah, he's the best intern I've ever had. My only, my only intern, but my best one. First, best, and only. Um, so uh, sometimes I like to uh, ask this question, and... Uh, the last time I did it backfired on me, so I'm resurrecting it and, and see, seeing how it does. It's a question that Debbie uh, Millman asks on her uh, podcast um, every month, uh, which is called um, Design Matters. Um, and the question is, what is your first creative memory? The first time that you were, you know, young and you remember doing something and then sort of looking, get it, you know, backing up and looking at it going, wow, that, that was sort of interesting and creative. I have, I have two things. Um... First one is eating Play-Doh in preschool. <laughs> what um, color was it? Uh, I specifically red and yellow, and I think maybe even trying to max, mish them up and mash them up to see if the color, the flavor changed. And well, then my second more professional memory when I realized maybe I could do art was drawing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, in grade school for friends during recess. I would just sit, you know, instead of playing sports or whatever, I would sit down and you know, right. draw teenage big ninja turtles for people. That's awesome. I have to date myself. We uh, uh, we actually had uh, Paul Jenkins was on our uh, our chat uh, a couple months ago, and he's a, a comic book writer for Marvel, and that was one of his first projects. Actually, was working on the beginnings of what Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was. Wow. We've come full circle here. Yeah. That's awesome. Um. So you recently did, uh, in March, you did a South by Southwest talk? Or a yeah. You were on a panel for South by Southwest, was that correct? I, I was on a panel, yeah. It was uh, put together by Jen Beckham from 20 by 200. And it was... That's something that's, you know, sort of, um, sort of a trending topic, if you will, right now in not only design, but like, but like tech, you know, this idea of sort of curating your life and, and filtering your life because 
we're exposed to so many different channels of media right now. You know, the only way to make any sense of it is to sort of curate the things that you're interested in. You know, and that's also sort of how like Design Chat started is just by talking about design on Twitter. And um, and and so that's a that's a very interesting thing. You know, to be able to translate it translate that into the design and creative world. Mm -hmm. So with all the changes that are happening in sort of social media and different ways of communi communicating, are you, are you into the sort of tech end of that? Are you an early adopter in any of that? It seems like we're getting to this threshold where, you know, in the last two years, um, if, if you were already into the Twitter and, you know, different types of Facebook and social media and all this, where you could, it, there was just enough content where you could handle it. And with so many people getting involved, I think this year we've crossed the barrier where there's so much noise and so much activity. Um, there is a threshold being crossed where it's, it's hard to control anymore, you know. You know, I take a day off and I've missed seven or eight hundred blog posts. And there's no way I can catch up on all that stuff. If I take a week off vacation, I can't catch up. It's gone. Um, yeah. And so now I just, I don't even care anymore. I just mark all as red and walk away because if it's important, nine out of ten of these other blogs are going to repost it anyways. Um, there's no exclusivity anymore. Um, it's super overwhelming. It very much so is. And that's when... That's why I think it's interesting when we talk about, you know, there being, uh, you know, different levels of curators out there. I think that's going to be a, a very important thing in the future because we're going to start to identify those curators who are doing it successfully and serving up the things um, that do, you know, serve, you know, have the most interest for these individual sort of niche topics. Yeah, and I think, you know, and going beyond curator in like a uh, gallery setting, whatever, I think it's also really important, like going back to imprint who I'm working with, the guy who's doing my distribution and who also does this print shop. Uh, it's not like a Zazzle store where anybody can set up a Zazzle shop. And no offense to Zazzle, but you go on there and the signal to noise ratio is really overwhelming and it's really hard to find good stuff. Um, then you go to a place like imprint or there's other places out there where uh, there's somebody involved in filtering through. And so when you go to look from browse for prints, it's much easier to find what you like because there isn't so much crap on there, you know, and not, and, and crap is subjective, but uh, I just still think it's always going to be really important. Do you think that um, 
uh, we, on Design Chat, we always talk about how designers and artists now that we, you have to wear a lot of hats. A lot, of, especially if you're, you know, publishing things your, yourself like you do. Um, you have to be able to control a lot of different types of areas of, of your life and do it um, well if you want to be heard. Um, and there's this interesting crossing of like art and technology and design. Do you think that all the technology that's being infused into design is a good or a bad thing, or, or that it doesn't even matter that the that the artists are just going to keep on doing their own thing? I uh, the the latter of the of, of the three. I I I have so many. I mean, I have a lot of painter friends and a lot of illustrator friends. Traditional, you know, watercolor and pencil. But more and more, even these traditional artists are just going to the computer because it's easier and it's easier to make art that's quicker to print and more print ready. Um, and then there's all these amazing artists out there that as soon as the technology became available to them, they just became way better artists. And uh, I'm thinking of example, there's uh, champagnevalentine.com, friends of mine who live in the Netherlands now, I think, but they're moving to London, um, do this really amazing, mostly web art. They just did a big thing for the Tate. I think they did like the Tate's iPhone app. And they're a type of art group that prior to the internet would uh, maybe even making prints or, you know, doing great stuff, but not mind-blowingly accessible and quickly accessible. Mm -hmm. I just, I think there's no turning back and there's no reason to turn back. You know, there's a time not that long ago that acrylic paints didn't exist. Now that's considered like, uh, you know, a traditional form of, you know, media for painting, but it's plastic, you know, that's not natural, you know, it's, um, I read, I read in uh, in one of your bios that you also, I think, actually was in a video that you did with John Maida last year uh, at the uh, Rhode Island School of Design. Um, that you also have a music label. Yeah, that's actually the. I tell you the all the information on it, but we're working on a new distro right now. Uh, PretendRecords.com. Uh, right now, I think if you click on all the uh, iTunes links, nothing's going to work. But. Um, yeah, I've uh, I used to be in a band, and uh, during being in the band and then after leaving the band, I've always been really interested in uh, making in the same way with Fasthetic, making uh, other friends of mine and people I like's work accessible to the world. And running a record label is the same idea, you know. It's finding music I like. I can. It's always really cool to see those two worlds so sort of collide, you know, and see and see what happens when those worlds collide. And you know, we've we've seen this change in the music industry where You've gone from records where people would worship these great pieces of art and sort of like display them uh, while they're listening to their music down to CDs where, okay, well, you kind of still have little books um, and it's sort of interesting and now all, all music seems to be digital and, and they're still sort of figuring out where does the artwork fit into uh, the music industry. And, you know, there are like some rumors out there right now that Apple's working on new sort of music interface and a new way to show um, artwork when you buy music and when you're experiencing music on a computer. Are you, do you have anything, you know, uh, any sort of like strong opinion on, on ways that that should work or shouldn't work or what's working and what's not right now? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're at a point where I don't know how many people here, have, the active users, pay for their music or not, but uh, most people I know, fortunately or unfortunately, don't pay for their music. So they're already getting in way too much music into their uh, new release folder and not caring about it so much. I, I talk to friends all the time that remember the day, and I remember this still fondly, you'd buy that one record a week or a month and listen to it a million times and learn all the words. And yeah, you'd look at the record cover art and read all the lyrics. And now I'm at a point where I have so many new releases that I forget that I've listened to something and I'll have to go through and, what is this? Oh, and listen to it again. Oh, yeah, that. That's great, or whatever. And actually, the newish, new version of iTunes, it took a while to get used to, but now I kind of like the fact that it forces you to look at all the record covers, because yeah. now instead of looking at all these random band names of bands, I honestly don't know who they are, I can click around and go, that looks really cool, what's that? And I'm going back and checking out things again for the first time. Um, so they were kind of coming full circle. It's never going to be the same, but, but a lot of the bands that I work with, even not local bands, but bands that I get commissions to do record covers for, are more concerned about the record covers again because they realize it's about the music and then it's really about the image sometimes a lot more. Uh, a lot of bands are doing videos again, you know, which for a good five, ten years it seemed like there were no music videos being made. 
it's just really interesting to see the way that like a visual communication can change your experience or enhance your experience of music. You know, the way that your auditory senses work with your visual senses and how those two sort of like relate and can trigger memories and that sort of thing. It's a great point you say about like going through your cover flow in iTunes and just how much faster you can sort of scan what you're looking at as opposed to the text. Yeah. It's, uh, and, and now what, only about a year or two ago, they started including even the, the PDFs for some of the select records where you could then right. actually look at the inner art. Unfortunately, Apple is still really monopolizing the whole thing and all bands don't get to include PDFs and all bands don't get to do this new enhanced LP thing. But I think we're just going to get to the point where that's all that makes things relevant again, other than great music. Right, right. Um, so, um... That, that kind of segues into an interesting topic about what's going on with Apple itself and, and how they release um, new products. They just had a new product release uh, yesterday. There's a new iMac, uh, a new uh, MacBook, and a new uh, Magic Mouse. And, and I'm really sort of like, I'm, I'm always trying to like find different ways to experiment with how to like create artwork on the screen through your computer. And now it seems like there's like, a new evolution if I mean if it really works out of this mouse where the whole top of this mouse is is touch sensitive and multi touch sensitive where you can make gestures on top of this mouse and it's it's more than just clicking now you can do different types of swipes and, and, and movements and that sort of thing do you think that's going to have any impact on the way that artwork is being made well using me as an example um, well, let me see I'm gonna have to unplug this for a second so you can you show us see your it. setup yeah I am clearly not motivated by uh, fancy new mouses. I use a thumb trackball mouse. Nice. And uh, I have it's five. It's like Marble of these. Madness. Yeah, I have five of these in case they stop making them. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. I have a lot of friends, a lot of illustrator friends, even ones that started out uh, doing more traditional art, uh, non-computer stuff, who are now really into the. Uh, Wacom tablet and stuff, which I I might have no interest in using, but any of these technology things, I don't think they're going to like make art better or make it easier. I think they're going to more likely just come up with new ways of doing things. And so maybe gestural stuff, I mean, I can't imagine how that would apply to like Photoshop or Illustrator, but somebody might make an accident. I mean, a lot of art is happy accidents and it's going to be like, whoa, look what this, this thing broke my Illustrator, but look what cool thing it did. And, right. you know, hopefully something becomes that. Um, uh, another piece uh, I want to do a little bit of uh, current news also is um, the uh, the Ralph Lauren sort of scandal that was going on with the retouch yeah. model. Did you hear anything about that? Yeah, I uh, I'm friends with the Boing Boing people, and they were pretty pretty. Uh, I don't know if you saw any of the Boing Boing twist the uh, comments back and forth, the legal stuff. It was well. That's all how it kind of started, right? It was uh, Jenny Zardan who who spotted this image and did a quick post. And just on the sort of ridiculousness of, of how heavily this image had been uh, retouched, and then Ralph Lauren kind of posted, you know, you know, that's copyright infringement. You can't be showing our stuff on your yeah. blog. And then hilarity ensued when, <laughs> when they started to argue sort of publicly um, over the ridiculousness of this this heavy retouching. What's your sort of like stance on, you know, retouching uh, images of people or women in general? You know, I, about, I have a, a very strong opinion on this but uh it's not really but it doesn't really go one way or another i totally think that ralph lauren should have been called out for this and i think that boing boing handled it wonderfully and i love the back and forth the legal back and forth and then the sort of scurrying around that ralph lauren did to kind of cover their tracks uh but you know you you flip through a women's magazine or you walk through you know like see some public advertising for maybelline eyelash makeup or different brands and the eyelashes that these are producing are unreal. They can't happen. They're four or five inches coming off the face. You look like spider faces. And nobody seems to really care about that, but that's just as unattainable as this pencil-thin model that's been photoshopped on the Ralph Lauren ad. And now they have uh, medicine that women can put on their eyelashes to grow their eyelashes out longer. Really? It's, yeah. It's I, Just a couple weeks ago, I saw a commercial with Brooke Shields. Is like, yeah, Brooke Shields uh, has prescription eyelash medicine. Which I jokingly have talked about putting on That's my real? mustache too. It's to, it's a totally real medicine, and it's basically encouraging women to try to attain 
the fake eyelashes they've been seeing for years in magazines. I'm totally blown so away by that. <laughs> it's not even a full circle thing. It's just like, you know, you see enough glamorized bucks and women on TV. You see that many more uh, cosmetic surgeries. You know, the, it, it's it's an unfortunate way that we're all going, but uh, I don't know if there's anything we can do about it. You know, the world. Well, there are definitely there are people who are calling for the argument that um, all Photoshop retouching of people should be banned and. I, th I think once you start doing, you know, going to that extreme, that you get on a slippery slope of what's well, allowable put, and, and, and what's not. You're going to put me out of business eventually. I don't. I mean, if you treat Photoshop people as illustration work, and you have a little note in the corner that says this is an illustration, that might be a better way of doing it than just saying no Photoshop stuff anymore. Because there's a lot of illustrators right. I know. I mean, Chuck, Chuck, who was supposed to talk tonight, uses a lot of Photoshop in his work. He's not Photoshopping people to make them look skinnier or whatever but he's using the same tools right right so to start prejudicing against that pretty scary i think you know it's there's there's an interesting argument about like if you're creating artwork to sell a product um that the artwork should kind of show you how the product makes you feel and there's this sort of like intangible like brand essence you know of, of the excitement that you can create around an idea or a product or a thing you know um, you know, and there is this sort of, you know, very gray line about where you have to show exactly what the reality is, like, like uh, making a commercial for a kid's toy, you know, where it's, you know, it's maybe like a little army thing and they set up this huge stage and, and they're having these, uh, you know, cars drive through things and shoot things and it's this really amazing thing and then you get it and it's just a little hunk of plastic that you get to shove around your floor, you know? Yeah, um, but, you know, I guess what, what bothers me about this is that, so that, and I, I agree that that's basically false advertising, and so you're gonna have a lot of disappointment. But how is it not false advertisement to have like a beer commercial where all these amazing, beautiful people are all dancing to this great music in a bar that's perfectly lit? I've been to so many bars, and I've never been to a bar like any beer commercial. Um, <laughs> and so I'm disappointed. So can I sue the video people who lit the stuff better, or to the people that casted the models that would never have gone right. to that bar in the first place? Right. You know, it's it's not. I, and I and that's what it's, scares it's me about slow. this whole idea of people calling for like you shouldn't manipulate anything. Is where does it stop? You know, it's and it's you know if that I mean, all, does happen, that'll put like the entire industry out of business. I mean, we're talking. This is design chat, and we're basically manipulating and trying to sell products that oftentimes we don't care about. So, it to set a fine line of what is appropriate or not is I don't think something that should be done by the powers that be. Yeah. Hopefully right, our right. Uh, po our populace is smart enough to know better that eyelashes don't grow four inches long. Speaking of the populace, uh, we're going to transition into our Q&A session here. Uh -oh. um, and I have printed out a curated list, if you oh, will, nice. of some questions that have already popped up tonight. I know there's a lot that have popped up after this, but uh, we'll, we'll try to address those as they come up. But let's start running through these a little bit. Um, this question is from uh, uh, Michelle not Michael, Michelle Cruitt. Uh, I made the mistake earlier, if you weren't here. If you went to school for graphic design, how would you uh, make the transition to illustration? Okay, so uh, I did art for most of my life. I originally went to the Artists of Chicago and was planning on doing video and or painting as my career. I dropped out of art school because I wasn't uh, applying myself and I ran out of money. And my mom said, my mom who's a graphic designer said, uh, you should consider graphic design. It's like art, but you can make a, you have a job uh, out of it. So I begrudgingly went back to school and majored in graphic design. And during my first full-time job as a graphic designer, I realized I could draw pictures on the computer. So I ended up spending all my free time when nobody was looking, drawing pictures on the computer. And I ended up self-training myself back into art. So awesome. that's... That's how that worked. So the, your sort of like advice for people who want to do that is just go out there and experiment. Oh yeah, I have so many illustrator friends. I have a lot of illustrator friends that are taught and, I, and that you can tell. I mean, a lot of times a professional, well-taught illustrator is, you know, their work is really deep and really conceptually driven. But I also have a lot of really incredible illustrator friends that just one day wanted to start drawing on the computer and realized they were good at it and now they make money off it. So. There's not one way to do this kind of stuff. Right, right. 
Um, next question comes from Artrox, A-R-T-R-O-X. Uh, hey, have you thought about linking with uh, Zinio or some, uh, similar for online subs? I'm not I have no idea Zinio. what that question means, by the way. I, I know what the question means. I saw it earlier, but uh, what is Zinio? I, I think the question is basically is uh, questioning the way I'm accepting submissions for... Okay, so uh, is it a, a print-on-demand kind of thing, or is it just... Uh, Joshua, no. Well, I should be. I'm hearing that it's like a Mac magazine software. Oh, to view okay. magazines in. You know, I've actually, I hadn't heard of Zinio, but I will check this out. I'm putting it in a list of things to check out. Um, I've actually recently been contacted by some people that want to do, uh, that idea of you know, there's a there's a company that's doing sort of comic book distribution through iPods and iTunes and sort of online and trying to do that mm. with magazines like Fastletics. And, and I'm totally open to that. I just, I feel like it kind of uh, waters down the printed copy. And for me, the printed copy is always the most important. Thing. Uh, next question is from Chuck Stenick. Uh, did you do any Cyan artwork in Second Life? Cyan Island in uh, Second Life? No, I did not. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Easy answer. All right, moving on. Abron uh, asks, how do you make color choices? Are they vital to the message you're trying to portray? So this color choice thing is interesting because I just recently did a project where uh, an art director contacted me, showed me the work I had done that they liked and that they wanted me to do more of, and then gave me a color palette to work with. And I realized very quickly that they had eyedroppered a lot of my work and grabbed colors from it, and then they wanted me to reuse this palette, which was totally fine. But I would surprisingly answer the question with, it's completely arbitrary, the colors that I use. Um, I just, I'm still using freehand, like I mentioned before, and I'll just open up the freehand color palette for any given project to just grab, without rhyme or reason, 10 to 30 random colors that I just like at the moment, and then try to make them all work together. Mm -hmm. So they're sort of specific to each project, but there's a lot of obvious carryover between projects. Cool, cool. Um, uh, another question from Abron. Is your art ever based on real photographs, Photoshop effects, or uh, would you rather just freehand something? So really it's, it's about process. It's like... Yeah, um, it's a process, a combination of freehanding stuff with photo, uh, photos I take nine times out of ten that uh, I create my own source material. Um, obviously, if like a magazine says, hey, can you draw this and here's a picture of this person, I'll work from that picture. but. Um, what I like to do is get multiple photographs of the same person or the same product and try to combine them. So, for example, an illustration of my face might include reference material from lots of different photos, um, which is why a lot of times the illustrations of me look more like a comic or a cartoon character than I would because I'm taking the sort of extreme pieces of each one. Um, so it's, it's a variety of things. Uh, Goldfish asks, please talk about your work with the Arts Commission of Greater Toledo. Oh, gladly. Uh, I am a board member of the Arts Commission of Greater Toledo, and I am a product of their programs. I actually, when I was in high school, they had this really cool thing called Young, Law, Young Artists at Work program, and it pays high school kids to do public art projects, murals and painting of benches and things. And... Uh, uh, that was my first experience getting paid to do art. I did it for the first two years of the program back in, I think, 93, 94, mm -hmm. or 94, 95. And now, 15 years later, all of my charity work goes back to the same organization, and I sit on their board um, because, for me, it was a sort of founding founding uh, moment in my art life. Very cool. Um, terrific uh, question for Dustin. What's your obsession with the human skull? Well, uh, it's not so much an obsession uh, as I earlier, and I don't use that skull so much anymore, in fact, barely ever, but uh, I have some sort of reoccurring characters in my work, which, you know, my I, I often appear in my work, friends of mine often appear in my work, and then little things like color wheels, these crystals I've been using, and then skulls. Um, and I have a real obsession with the frailty of life and focusing on, you know, this concept of, of mortality. So the skull is sort of a constant reminding character in my work. 
not to sound too cheesy. You don't. Um, <laughs> next question is from uh, Michelle Pruitt again. Uh, oh wait, oh, I think I've seen this one already. As uh, they're feeding, they're feeding me questions as I'm uh, going along here. Um, from Gorific, uh, Dustin, do you have a favorite design medium? Is there a medium you haven't done or a client you would love to work with? As far as design medium goes, I mean, I've done a lot of print work, a lot of paperwork. Um, I've done a good share of, like, clothing and product stuff. Um, I'm actually working on my first uh, animated uh, piece right now for... Fuel Television, it's Fuel TV dot, or Fuel TV. They do kind of like old school MTV artist vignettes. Um, I'm working on the 23rd in the series for them. I'm working with an animation company in LA. In fact, in my inbox right now, I've just been emailed a sample because that's what I'm working on right now. And uh, this animation thing is really motivating me to take that on as sort of a new, uh, a new direction of my work. I actually literally just today ordered After Effects because uh, I have no motion experience, but I really want to know how to do it. So I would say that's probably the next uh, direction my work's going to go in. And I'd also really like to start working with uh, more, you know, I've done shoes and t-shirts and stuff, but I'd like to do other weird products like pocket knives and things, you know, sort of more industrial day-to-day -day stuff. Very cool. Um... Checking for some more questions here. Uh, Lifter Baron question, have you uh, used or relied on reps in the past for getting your work? Representation. Wait, uh, ask that question again? Um, asking if you had been uh, used or relied upon getting a, a mm -hmm. representation to get your work. No, uh, I have always been completely self-repped. That's been part of the fun of this whole thing is uh, Half of my day is spent making work, and the other day, half of the day is uh, hustling, which I really enjoy doing. How much would you say uh, the percentage of the job is is the hustle? Seventy-five percent of my job is hustling. Uh, and so, what the, what percentage is actual artwork time? Three percent. No, it's like uh, it's the other twenty-five. I mean, my day is pretty much a quarter working, and then seventy-five percent trying to trying to find more work, but in a it's, fun, you know, sort of organic way. It kind of seems like um, that's something that's not really discovered until you just kind of throw yourself into it. You know, when you hear, you know, if, if you, if you, you know, go to design conferences or something like that, or you're around young designers and that sort of thing, um, how much it, it hasn't soaked in yet it, at the early stages of a career, um, how much of the job and how much of your time is spent doing activities that have nothing to do with design or your actual artwork. Yeah, I mean, school doesn't prepare it for you at all. You know, that, that final semester of college where they're trying to rep, you know, prepare your portfolio and stuff, it's all really helpful. But they should be encouraging you just as much to, you know, join the AIGA or join other local groups so you can start getting your name out and interacting with people because... Uh, you know, it's rare that you find your next job from the job you're at. You know, you find your next job from people you know and experiences mm -hmm. you've had that, you know, show you new opportunities. So I think school could do a better job of that. Um, young people, I mean, I talk to college kids and high school kids a lot, and I always stress, like, you know, I'll say, like, look around in the room you're in. Like, you're going to remember all these kids for the rest of your life, whether or not you work with them, but there's going to be at least one person in this room that 10 years from now, you're continuing to work with, so, you know, pay better attention to each other and start, you know, establishing those relationships now. Great advice. Definitely, that's great advice. Um, I think we're, uh, we're getting near the end of our hour here, so we're going to start to wrap up. Um, quick thank you to, uh, to you, Dustin, uh, for coming to hang out. Uh, My pleasure. It was awesome chat, you know, um, and you're, you're welcome back anytime. Um, we, uh, for anybody who's uh, here and never seen us before, uh, this is Design Chat. We do this every week on uh, Mashable.com slash chat. <clears throat> uh, so thank you to them for uh, letting us, uh, you know, send out video through their, their chat forum. Um, thank you to uh, Samata Mason uh, for letting us broadcast from their offices here in West Dundee. Very cool design agency. Definitely check them out when you get a uh, chance, SamataMason.com. And um, uh, on Twitter they are 
Um, oh, we're, we're tweeting it out. It's coming up right there. Um, Visualize Change is on Twitter. Um, I'm Ryan McGovern. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at Hoobajoob and at Design Chat. Uh, I'm a designer, art director from the Chicagoland area. Um, so thank you to everybody for, uh, for coming out. And uh, stay tuned uh, to the uh, Twitter account for some information about you know, who's going to be on the next show and uh, upcoming shows. And we've got a website also, designchat.info. Um, so thank you to everybody and Destin especially for, uh, for coming out tonight. Thanks for having me. See ya. Bye.